in Cuba, when you are a recognized artist, your whole life is monitored and reviewed by the government. I was the main conductor of the national band in 1993 when we were invited to perform in a political concert. At the end, one of the commanders of the revolution approached me and said, you are like a commander conducting the troops in the battlefield. I later was called to be his personal musical advisor. After a year, I ended this assignment because I considered that my personal freedom was more important than dangerous ties to political figures. In 1998, the National School of the Arts needed a conductor for the youth orchestra. I accepted. In spite of the prestige of the National Youth Orchestra, several restrictions were connected to this assignment. We couldn't play American music. We didn't have accessories for the instruments. We didn't have a music library, and we didn't even have music stands. I was later, later I was told by one of the ministers of culture that the country didn't have enough resources to support this project. Months later, the same vice minister was sexually harassing me, and I rejected his advances, but was fearful of the consequences. Fortunately, he did not retaliate, but I got it then. I was alone. I just, I just wanted my students to, to understand the music as the language of the heart, beyond cultural boundaries. During our work together, certain things were achieved, like convincing Fidel Castro that we were gladiators fighting for the revolution to succeed. He gave us permission to play some American music, and soon, the gladiator and Star Wars themes were our anthem. Secretly, while performing these masterpieces, we were fighting for our human rights. Thanks to the help of fantastic friends from Mexico and Bermuda, we started to get what we needed in order to play what we love most, the music. These marvelous musicians won the right to perform in the Amadeo Rolda Theater, the most important performance hall in Havana City. We needed a name for the orchestra, and we call it Tempo, since we were traveling between countries, feelings, and styles. Before the opening of, a, of every performance, we gathered all together backstage, and hon holding hands, we stated in one voice, Let's play like it is the last time. In 2001, while still a member of the National Youth Orchestra, my son Sandro was invited to the USA. On that trip, he sought and was given asylum in the United States. I now was motivated to pursue freedom for myself. Five long years had passed since I had seen my only son, Sandro. Five long years of concerts and tears. Five years trying to keep alive the hope of my musicians with music as my only weapon. One day, a Mexican pianist invited me to Mexico to work in the University of Nuevo Leon, Monterrey, for 10 days. Several phone calls and conversations took place to help the approval process along. I knew that it was going to be very difficult for me to get the white letter permit to get out of Cuba. I was sure that they had not forgotten my son's defection in the United States. 
I hope you understand that I cannot mention names or places as I don't want to compromise those who help facilitate my escape out of the country. One night, the person who was helping me with the Mexican contact gave me a gold watch. This watch would confirm who I was to the contact person in Mexico. I had in my hands my ticket to freedom. On that February night of 2006, my mother's voice brought me back to reality. Listen to this, my daughter. I don't want to see you coming back this time. Your place is with your son now. I have lived my life, and now is your time to live yours in freedom. Next morning, in the international airport, my mom gave me her blessings, and with her eyes full of happiness, she waved her right hand as a goodbye to me. I never imagined that it was going to be the last time that I felt her warm embrace and strong protection as mother, only mothers can give to us. She passed away last October 26, 2014, and I couldn't, I couldn't close her eyes. But please, come back to my arrival in Mexico. Between welcomes and lunches, it was necessary for me to reach the owner of the watch. We met in that person's house, and everything was set up. No one, absolutely no one, could know a word about it. Not even my son, who was here at Eastman School of Music in Rochester, New York. Between concerts and master classes, the time flew and the Cuban handler who was assigned to watch me didn't miss one of my presentations. <laughs> How can I get rid of this person? My God! The night of my farewell dinner, I pretended to have an obsex stomach. Of course I am an artist. <laughs> and rapidly, he offered to take me to the hotel. That was it. My God, I'm fried. <laughs> but an angel, a miracle, a Mexican woman said, I'll take her. I'll take her because I need to send some presents to Cuba with her. <sighs> that was close. Back to the hotel, I called a cab that drove me to the gas station where the owner of the, job, the, the, the watch picked me up minutes later. Two days and nights, I was hidden in that house. The night of the third day, they told me that it was time to leave. Several instructions were given to me, don't speak if we are stopped by the federales, don't get out of the car if we don't ask you to do it, we cannot cross you to the American side. You are going to have to walk alone. And if someone is calling you by man, don't stop. Don't answer. Don't look back. Just keep walking. We passed two federal tolls. After the second one, a flat tire. Almost next to the third one, they said, don't even blink because this one is the worst one. And they were right. Like Mexicanos Federales with shotguns standing near something that looked like a barricade, stopped the car. They looked inside the car. I was shaking. They looked at me. They talked to the driver. But I am here, guys. I made it. <laughs> Finally! I was in Reynosa, the border town next to McAllen, Texas. On February the 12th, 
in 2006, I walked 35 minutes over the bridge who would lead me to the land of freedom. My Cuban ID and my heavy Latino accent were my strong credentials. The immigration officer almost jumped because I was another little Cuban seeking for asylum. For three hours, they were interrogating me over and over with the same questions. And finally, the phrase that I deeply wished to hear caressed my ears. Welcome to America. You are free to go. I just, uh, what can I tell you? It was the start of a new and bright life as a free woman. As every other immigrant, my first job was in a restaurant as a dishwasher. I cleaned houses, my son and I became uh, American citizens, and the rest, perhaps, could be another subject for a future TEDx. <laughs> but as my grandmother, Abuela, used to tell me, you just follow these five worlds. Let them to guide you. Hope, will, friendship, peace, and love. That's all I want for you. That's all I have to offer you. But before I say goodbye, I would like to play a, a Cuban title written by Ignacio Cervantes, a Cuban composer that lived in 19th century. Farewell to Cuba. Adios a Cuba. <laughs> 